Today I want to talk about something that is crucial for your well-being. Now I want to ask the question, how do you feel about your life? Is there a sense of discontentment that is there? Do you know anybody that's struggling with discontentment? Heard about these two brothers that were really pretty bad guys. They were They weren't very nice, they were mean, they were selfish, they stole from others, they um, they were very materialistic, they weren't great to their to their families. Anyway, one of them passed away, and um, they both had gone to the same church. And so the other brother went to the pastor of the church and said, uh, would you be willing to do my brother's funeral? And the pastor said, okay. The brother said, there's only one requirement, I, and he showed him the stack of cash that he was going to pay him for doing, doing the funeral service. It's only one requirement, and that is that you have to say that my brother was a saint. So the pastor kind of thought about it for a moment, and then he said, okay, I'll do it. So he got up to speak at the funeral, and the pastor said, talking about the guy who passed away, he was a mean guy. There was nothing really nice about him that I can think of. He was terrible to his wife, his children. Uh, he was self-centered. He was selfish. Uh, he stole from people. He cheated them. He constantly was all about himself. And when you talk with him, he'd only talk about his accomplishments. And I would have to say, though, that compared to his brother... He was a saint. (laughs) One of my favorite, probably my favorite team. And I can no longer call them the Oakland Raiders. So I only refer to them as the Raiders. But my favorite team is the Raiders. And they're the most important player on their team is the quarterback. And the quarterback has done really well. He's been successful in a lot of different ways. His passing, he's probably one of the top 12, 13 quarterbacks in the National Football League. Um, he's led a number of comeback wins. But there are plenty of Raider fans who are not happy with having him as their quarterback you would have to say they're discontented with him. They would like somebody else to be there, somebody who's had a winning record, somebody who maybe is, has been a, had great seasons rather than good seasons. Now, one of the things I've discovered in life, and you probably have too, is that discontentment is not just found among sports fans. But it's, it's everywhere. It's among the rich and the poor, um, the famous, the popular, the, those who are unknown. Discontentment can be found in families, at workplaces. Every ethnic group has discontentment. Every country you see discontentment. But the problem with discontentment is that it's hard on us. It takes a toll upon you when you are discontented. I mean, it can lead to um, discouragement, frustration, family problems. Sometimes when we are discontented, we'll take out our discontentment on those who are close to us. It can lead to friction in the family. It can create problems at the workplace. Discontentment can have a tough effect upon us. Uh, We... When we're discontented, it can lead to high levels of stress, uh, just trying to get away from whatever it is that we feel like is causing our discontent, uh, depression, sometimes even suicidal thoughts and suicidal actions can be the result of discontentment when it's taken us too far. What's, What's interesting to me is that it doesn't really matter how successful you are You can still be discontented even when you are wealthy, when you're popular, when you have reached your career goals. Classic example is Solomon, the king of uh, the nation of Israel, who was probably as rich and as famous and as 
effective in his work as anybody who has ever lived. And yet in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, he wrote, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Discontentment. Now, when you look at um, his thoughts about how he did his job, how his work was and how it impacted his life, he wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3, What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? He was dis discontented with his career, king of Israel, making fabulous amounts of money, and yet he wasn't happy with it. In fact, there wasn't really anything that you could say that Solomon was glad regarding his life. I mean, it just, nothing seemed to matter to him, and, and he was just frustrated with how everything had gone. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 2 through 8, he wrote, Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven. During the few days of their lives, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. And yet, he wasn't happy with what he had. He was thoroughly discontented. In Ecclesiastes 2.11, he said, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. You talk about a miserable individual. Solomon was it. And yet, when you would, if you were to look at his life, you would say he had everything. Whatever we would think of as being a cause of discontentment, he didn't possess. <laughs> he, he was the king of the roost. And yet, he wasn't contented. Contentment is the great jewel of life. It, is, it, it supersedes all the other parts of life. Because no matter what we do, what we accomplish, how great things are, if we don't have contentment, we're going to be miserable. I want you to consider Rachel. Now, Rachel you could probably make a case that Rachel had everything she ever wanted in life, except for one thing. She had um, a great marriage, it seems. I mean, her and her husband seemed to be ma madly in love with each other. Um, her husband's career was taking off. He was becoming more and more successful, and, and they were gaining uh, in their finances, finances and doing very well. And yet, because she didn't have any children, um, she was discontented. Discontentment filled her heart. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 2, when Rachel complained again and again to her husband Jacob, I don't have any children. I want to have children. I'm miserable. Give me children. Jacob responded to her. Jacob became angry with her and said, Am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? In other words, what can I do about your situation? How can I take care of it? You know, the funny thing is that many think that others are responsible for our lack of happiness. And it isn't true. I mean, we could go to, um, we could blame our, our husband or our wives for, our wife for, for how discontented we are. Many people do it. Many blame their, many children blame their parents for their discontentment. Employees blame their supervisors or the owners of the company that they're discontented. 
Family members blame each other for their discontentment. People in church blame the church for the discontentment they have. Pastors can blame the members of the congregation for their own discontentment. I mean, it just goes on and on. People thinking that someone else determines whether or not they're going to be contented or not. So they always, they're look, we, we have this tendency to look at others and blame them for the state of our internal condition, for our lack of contentment, for our discontent. One thing that, that interests me is that you have, you have these two women in the scriptures that have almost the same circumstance. Rachel, who couldn't have children and was discontented. And Hannah, who also couldn't have children and was discontented. Both of them had had husbands who loved them. But because they didn't have children, they were very sad, brokenhearted over their situation. Now, Hannah took a different path than Rachel did. Because we find in Scripture that rather than blaming her husband for the situation, rather than looking to him to solve the problem she had with her discontentment, Hannah went to God. In 1 Samuel verses 10 through 11, it reads, in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me. You see how discontented she was? And not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. So Hannah, rather than falling into the same trap that Rachel did, or even that Solomon did, went to God and expressed openly her discontentment and let him know, these are the issues I have. But she looked to God to be the one to solve the problem that she was facing within. You see, this is where the struggle is for many of us. Rather than turning to Christ and asking him to be involved in our situation and to help us with the problem that we are facing or to intervene in whatever it is that is causing our discontentment, we look to this person and that person, we we. We, we talk to, we, we, we bring this matter to, to these people, these friends, these co-workers. But God is the only one that can really deal with the issue that's within us. Because our discontentment is within the heart. And it's God who can get into the heart and affect the change that is necessary that we might be done with our discontentment. It's God joined to you who can transform what's inside you. God is the one that we need to bring into our lives when discontentment has begun to take over. Now, the problem with discontentment is that the power of it is in its ability to ruin the way you think. You begin to see things in a way that is, that is wrong, that has, creates problems for you. It's almost like, um, like a drug that impacts your mind and changes and shapes the way you think and the way you perceive things. So that everything becomes colored by your discontent. Whether it's how things are going at work, your relationship with your family members, um, your, how, your friendships, um, your career moves. All those things are impacted by discontent. And so the way you think becomes determined the way you see things becomes determined by that discontentment that's taken hold of you. Your heart is completely shifted and your perception is redone when it comes when when discontentment begins to take over. 
discontentment is like a poison that ruins you. It is a poison to your soul. So what can we do to battle discontentment? Because it's such a major issue. It is, it is a huge problem for countless numbers of us. And it might be for you also. You might be struggling with discontentment right now. There may be something that's bothering you so much that it impacts the way you see everything. The way you interact with your friends, your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers. And when discontentment becomes an important part of how you're living your life, then you then people stop wanting to be around you. They don't like to, to, to have someone who's discontented in their own lives because maybe they're struggling with it too and it just compounds the matter for them. So what can we do about discontentment? Well, one of the things you could do is that you could pursue your God-given goals. Now, I'm not saying that it has to be related to the church or, or Christian in a sense. But as you look at your life and you think, what do I want to do next? What, where should I be heading? What, what should I try to do? And you bring God into the equation of thinking about it. God will give you some goals. And it will help you with this matter of discontentment because your mind will be upon what you're trying to do rather than what's happened. The problem with discontentment is it makes the now become miserable and discolors and, 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 disform, and, 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 and misshapes it, whereas a goal will take you so that you look forward and you begin to consider what my life can be as I pursue this goal. So it could be all sorts of different things. I mean, I, I know I have a friend who's a senior adult who is learning a new language. Your goal could be to teach younger people how to quilt or maybe to make blankets for people who are impoverished or are homeless. Your goal might be to begin a YouTube channel and, and teach people about the Bible. You might set a goal to um, begin to, to have a, a restored or a new relationship with somebody in your family or somebody, a friend of yours. Several years ago, I set a goal of trying to memorize a book of the Bible, and I thought it was impossible. Your goal might, be, might feel like it's impossible, or it might seem like because of your discontent that it can't be done, but as you bring God into that goal, you will find that your personality starts to come alive as you focus more and more upon how you can achieve that goal, how you can work towards it. A second way that we can um, be, get rid of our discontentment or, or push it away or, or work through it is to make God the center of your thoughts. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. And, and that seems like an impossible kind of task. But, but he wouldn't have said that if there wasn't the possibility that we could actually begin to do it. Every godly person that I know has made it a habit to check in with God on a regular basis through the day. Now, I'm not talking about just like throwing mountains and mountains of prayer requests upon God and saying, God, deal with this. God, take care of that. God, you're spending lots of time just bringing your issues before him. But just getting your mind thinking about him, doing this through the day, thanking him for various things that happen, blessings that you receive, good things that come your way, telling him, you know, Lord, I need help with this this issue, this work problem, this thing that's going on with my son, my, my, I'm having a struggle right now with communicating with my wife or my husband, just regularly going through the day 
and talking with him about the things that you're facing or, or just having conversations with him. The more you put your mind upon Christ, the more satisfied and contented you will find yourself. God will begin to reshape the way you think as he becomes a part of your thinking so that you will see what he's doing for you, how others are blessing you, what a great opportunity something is. But as you allow Christ to become a part of your thinking through the day, you will begin to uncover the secret of contentment. A third way to deal with this matter of discontentment is to give more attention to loving others. God has given you people in your life for a reason. And I would say the number one reason, because it's the great commandment, or the second great commandment, is to love them. To figure out ways that you can bless those around you. To share with them your love. To do kind things. To listen to them. To, to care about their issues. To affirm them. To strengthen their faith. God puts these people in your life because he wants you to be the vessel through which his love pours out of him and into them. And as your mind gets focused upon loving those around you, loving the people that God has put into your life, your contentment will grow. Your sense of the goodness of God and the value of the people that you've been given is going to increase. What are the sources of discontentment? I, I feel like I don't have what I, I don't have what I want. Things aren't going the way I planned. Nothing is seeming to work. I have all these problems in my life. But as your heart becomes focused on loving those that God has given you, your mind goes off of all those things, all those difficulties and troubles, and some things that aren't really a, a trouble at all because God has figured out a way to, to work it out for you. It's just a matter of time. But as you focus upon loving those that God has given you, blessing them, encouraging them, affirming them, your contentment will grow. And that is a great part of life. There's an author that, um, he's a, a, he was a Catholic priest. And I've read a couple of his books. And in one of them, he talks about the time when he was living in a monastery. And there were priests that were there from various parts of Europe. And there was one priest who just, just saw people in a different way than the others in the monastery. He, he saw the good that God had placed in them, the value of their lives. And I'm not saying that the other priests didn't see things that way also, but he was just at another level of appreciating the troubles and the difficulties that people have and, and, and how some have had great traumatic experiences and it has impacted why they react and respond to the way they do. But the age of around 54... He discovered that he had terminal cancer. So he decided to leave the monastery and move to one of the impoverished neighborhoods of Paris, France. And he got a job as a night watchman. And when he would get off work in the morning, he would go to a local park. And it was not a very nice place to go. The people, the homeless, the the drug addicts, the, the alcoholics that were there, um, prostitutes, um, men who were ogling the young women that were walking through there. The people just weren't good, what we would call good people. And he would sit on the bench, and then someone would come and sit and talk to him, and he would laugh and he'd tell stories, and, and, but he never, he never put a single person down. 
He always encouraged them, supported them, blessed them. And this went on for several weeks. Various people would come and go. And they would talk to him. They would sit on the bench. And one day there was this group of people that came. And they, they were all just talking. And the, and the priest was, was there. And they said, well, tell us about your life. Because we've told you about ours. And so he, t- he talked about his early life and how he'd become a priest and been a monastery. And it was funny. He said, the conversations kind of changed. The swearing decreased. Um, the ogling of the girls stopped happening. The drinking, the drug usage began to diminish. But after a few weeks, the priest wasn't there at the park. So everybody started wondering what, what happened to him. Turned out that he had died in his apartment. When they had the funeral for him, and of course this is before COVID-19, when they had the funeral for him, 7,000 people from around the world came to be at this unknown priest's funeral. Why? Because he allowed love to dominate the way he lived. And here's this man who was dying of cancer. He never expressed this discontentment. Oh, what a terrible life God has given me. How bad things have turned. How things could have been. I could have been a great priest, a successful minister. He never saw it that way. Because he was so focused on loving the people that God put in his life that he had contentment and he had real peace. What can you do this week? Keep your mind on God. Think about Him over and over again. Or, or maybe you would set some goals with God in mind that would give you a new direction. Love those God has given to you. Let them, let them be the objects of God's affection coming through you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that uh, this salvation that we have that comes from you is beyond imagination. And we can't even begin to consider how great heaven is. How wonderful it is to have a God like you. To be loved by you. To be nurtured, provided for, blessed by you. God, help us to be good at taking our eyes off of ourselves and our problems and our issues and things that we don't have and what we wish would be and put our minds upon you and those great people that you have given us. God, help us to be a bestower of your love. Help us to pursue the things that really matter, to give time to being in you. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Perhaps you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you'd like to do so right now. You say to him, Lord, I know that I've sinned. I've, I've broken the laws that you've established. I've done things that have been wrong. And I deserve to be punished for, for all the, the bad that I've done. But God, I pray, I thank you that you died on the cross to take my sins from me. And I believe that you rose from the dead and that you're alive. And because you've offered to give me the gift of eternal life, I receive it. It's a great gift. Come, be a part of my life. Take over my soul and make me completely new. Join me that I might be born again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this great salvation that you offer. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
May God bless you. May he enrich you this, this week. May you find God's help and support and strength in everything you do.